Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for How She Does It. On this show, we talk about all things women, money, and power. And today, painting. I'm Karen Feinerman. So, funny story about how I met our guest for today. I love art and have read a story about an art advisor. And in the story, they highlighted an artist who painted from old photos of her family that had an incredibly pure, in-the-moment 70s vibe. I loved the subject matter and had to find out who the artist was and how I could see her work, and maybe even buy one. To my great good fortune, I happened to be in L.A. the weekend that the artist had a show opening there the following day. The work captivated me so much that I ended up getting three pieces— I loved the way she used watercolors to create a feeling of people in motion and the colors and patterns of the era that brought me right back to my childhood with my own family. It turns out the artist was Lisa Edelstein. The Lisa Edelstein. You may know her best as Dr. Lisa Cuddy on House and Abby McCarthy on Girlfriend's Guide to Divorce or countless other roles in so many shows. She's currently playing an adoptive mom in the new miniseries called Little Bird, about a racist Canadian government policy known as the 60s scoop. Uh, And one more funny thing about meeting Lisa. We realized that we dated the same guy about 20 years apart. Lisa, thank you so much for being here and welcome. Hi. So happy to be here. All right. (laughs) Well, let's start at the beginning. Yeah. So The Cut recently wrote an article about the New York It Girl. And you made the list. (laughs) So this is about you when you were in your 20s. And it says, Lisa Edelstein, a nice girl from a New Jersey suburb, is explaining how she got to be Lisa E., New York's (laughs) reigning queen of the night, girl of the moment, the new Edie Sedgwick, and top celebutante of 1986. So I have to know, okay, who were you then and who are you now? Uh, oh God, I was 20 when that happened. So I had been clubbing since I had been 14. I was a gelatinous. <laughs> <laughs> I was a gelatinous creature with no real understanding of myself who was playing this role of this social creature trying to figure out how I fit into the world of adults. But really, I had nothing interesting to say. (laughs) I just had an enormous amount of enthusiasm and appreciation for the people around me because it was a very cool world that I happened upon in downtown New York at that moment in time. It was a microcosm. We don't really have microcosms anymore the way we used to. Like, you had to find those worlds. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I had no idea who I was. I had been at Mm -hmm. NYU. I was always knew I wanted to be an actress. I just didn't know how to break out of the obscurity of Wayne, New Jersey, and I hated Wayne. So I was desperate and hungry for learning about the world at large. You know, a lot of towns in New Jersey that are so close to the city are worlds apart. People don't even go into the city. And I was obsessed with the city. My grandparents lived in Brooklyn, so I had a sort of dual life and loved the village and just wanted to be in that environment. So, yeah, I think it was a lot of enthusiasm that got me all that attention. Uh I see 20-year-olds now, 19-year-olds, 18-year-olds who are so enthusiastic, and I understand it. There's nothing more beautiful than a person at that moment in their lives. They're so unformed. They're not cynical. They're just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating. You just want to stare at them. And you don't realize at that age how gorgeous you actually might be. Yeah, yeah. You're just beautiful. Yeah. And that's that's sort of lost on you at that age. Yeah, right. yeah. and that's okay. That's yeah. okay. <laughs> right. You learn. <laughs> so you're on the club scene. You're yeah. kind of trying to make a name for yourself Yeah. out of nothing, as you describe it. So I met this guy, James Clark, really funny gay kid that we met at NYU week one of school. And he was obsessed with this Warhol scene. And he had, I mean, I had been clubbing, but I didn't know about this particular world. And he literally knew who everybody was in this world. And he had flashcards to know their names and their faces. And he had planned out this mode of attack to go from obscurity into having a name in this town. And his idea was you just get yourself a name and then you can sidestep into what you really want to do, like once you have a presence. So he had all these exercises planned out. <laughs> Good for and, him. And he was, I was his sidekick. So I took his direction very well. And it was, I thought it was hilarious. So we were like gaming the system. So the only one I remember, and I only remember it because he wrote about it in his book, was we went to area. 
and it was really packed. And f- by then we had figured out how to get in for free and all that. But then we would go in the opposite direction in the crowded room and each ask people if they had seen the other. So I would be going, have you seen James St. James? And he would be saying, have you seen Lisa E? And we would do it Lisa all the Lisa E, you were already fully Lisa I E by then. I think so. Mm-hmm. Or maybe we were just mm-hmm. James and Lisa. I can't remember when the Lisa E started, but we would go the opposite direction and say each other's names and even though we knew nobody knew the other one, and then we would find each other, and then we'd go around the room and say, I found him, I found her, so that everybody would know what our names were. And it worked. And it, it worked. <laughs> That's amazing. It was hilarious. It was so interesting to me that he had all these planned exercises. It's brilliant in a way, it right? It is brilliant. Yeah. And indeed, what happened was we ended up having names in that world. And then our our names were on the short list of describing what a party was like, who was at that party. And so we became known in the social columns. And ultimately, for me, when I got too famous, when it ended up in the New York Times Magazine, in the Maureen Dowd piece, then I also inherited all these stalkers. And then so now I'm 20 and I have 40 stalkers and I am terrified and no security. No security. Right. No understanding yeah. of that, like mm-hmm. no experience with that. And I was still in school this whole time. I was studying theater, studying experimental theater, taking some really interesting classes. But all our friends were dying of AIDS. Like there was a lot happening in both the most exciting moments and the scariest moments all at the same time. And so having all these stalkers and getting too famous and feeling like people resented me for being famous for no reason made me put the brakes on. So then I started doing volunteer work for gay men's health crisis where I was going into the hospitals and visiting dying people and just trying to really re-ground myself in what was actually happening in the world. And all of that between what was going on at school, I was taking a course with Elizabeth Suedos, volunteering. I was dealing with these stalkers. My friends were dying. Old friends of mine from New Jersey thought AIDS was government hype. President Reagan had never even said the word. It was a very strange time. And with all of that energy, I ended up writing a musical. So wait a minute. So you are a musician as well? No. I <laughs> I composed the music in my head. And uh-huh. then I worked with a guy who had a very now antiquated computer system where he would lay down tracks mm-hmm. based on my description. And because the music was sort of mocking itself, it wasn't meant to be the most beautiful music. It mm-hmm. was meant to sort of be a poor imitation of a lot of other musical styles. Of the era? Of the era, Uh yeah. So there was Sondheim-type music (laughs) songs, and there was, like, really bad rap song and talky songs. It was a really fun musical. But because, the point being, because I was famous in the way James had prepared us, (laughs) (laughs) I was able to get a workshop production of my show at the La Mama Theater downtown. And then because they liked it, then I was able to get a full production. So in a way, James wasn't wrong about his big plan. But But you're still in school during this time. I finally Mm -hmm. left school when I did my play. So I was, I left at the end of my junior year to do my production. But I was actually very mad at NYU at that point in time because I'd had some crazy experiences in college and didn't feel like the school really gave a shit. They didn't really care until I was famous in the New York Times Magazine. Then suddenly the dean wanted to talk to me. But I'd had had a a terribly ill schizophrenic roommate who was threatening to kill me. And then I had another roommate with an obsessive boyfriend who I came home one night to a room full of blood It was very dramatic my freshman year of college, and so I didn't really feel like NYU was all that engaged in their (laughs) student body because that was on campus. So, yeah, so then I did this musical. And were you feeling like, this is it, I love this? Well, yeah, I mean, I grew up doing musicals. I grew up in every play, (laughs) even if I had to walk across the stage with a sign like that. I was so excited (laughs) to be on stage, and, and I did feel like I had finally found my own voice. But it was like a weird way of doing it. I did not expect to be somebody who wrote a play or wrote a musical. But that was what I was surrounded by. I was surrounded by a lot of performance artists. So it it came out of a very specific time period. So while you're doing that, did you have this idea of, I'm going to be very famous? When the New York Times Magazine came out and I experienced fame, I was so unhappy. And I realized that if fame was my goal, then I didn't want it. 
and that the only reason why I should be an actor or an artist of any kind is because it feeds me. And that, in the end, was true for me. Like, the process of creating, the process of performing, all that stuff is really meaningful to me. And fame no longer was a goal. And really, fame was just a tool to be able to do what I wanted to do because there was I didn't know how else to get there. Mm -hmm. The practical pathway just seemed out of reach for me. So I was like, well, I'm just going to make my own path and figure it out myself. So we know you went on to huge fame and you were on a gigantic show and the most popular show in the world. <laughs> That's sort of a whole other level of being in the world. Yeah. How I was mean, that? There was a lot of work. You know, I, I was a working actor and I had been on big shows, but not as the one of the main characters. And by the time we get to that show, I'm now in my 30s. So I've been working for a long time. And I was grateful to have that experience in my late 30s and not in my early 20s. Because I think when young people get that famous, they can't help but think that's what the world looks like now for them. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't. It's always going to shift. It's never going to stay like that. It is a fluid mm. experience. And when you are really famous in those moments that you're really famous, suddenly you're more beautiful and more interesting and more funny than you were five minutes before that, <laughs> right? Even though nothing's changed. The world receives you in a way that they're like constantly applauding. And if you're a young person having that experience, you'll believe it. Mm -hmm. You'll, Of course you'll believe it. You have no other right, experience. No, no other perspective. But for me at the age that I was, I knew it was temporary and I knew it wasn't a goal and I knew it had a dark side. And so I I knew to just enjoy what was enjoyable about it and do my best to not hold on to anything about the experience because it will mm -hmm. always shift. You will always mm -hmm. not be the most famous person again. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah. And also there is something about idolatry. There's something about people created idols to burn them down. They're effigies, you know, they're meant to be destroyed. And so when you are that effigy, like it's a dangerous place. Mm -hmm. People are looking to knock you over. So it shouldn't be the goal. It's a side effect. Uh -huh. And you have a to, byproduct. A okay. byproduct. Yeah. You have to really focus mm -hmm. on why you're there. Mm -hmm. And it's hard in those moments. It's hard to not have it affect your ego. And it's important to let it not affect your ego, not because you might become an egomaniac, but because it will go away. So I want to get to the way that I know you, which yeah. is as an artist. Yeah. And are you comfortable with me saying, I know you struggle with being called an artist? <laughs> sure. Yes, because you think that assigns some level of skill that you're not comfortable saying you have. Or achievement. Or Okay. Yeah. And yet... I only know you that way. That's so great. I and love it. And I was just so taken by your work. And I'm like, I got to find this. And so that was the way that I saw you. But where in your life did being an artist fit in? When did that start? How did it start? I think I always made things, always, from when I was a little kid, always drawing, always coloring. Not coloring like, you know, scrapping yeah. color, but like really focusing, coloring. So it was always something I did, but it was something I did for myself, something that was an inward practice. Did you ever want to show anyone? One time I made some jewelry, and the store wanted to sell it in New York, and so I packed it all up, and I was walking the six blocks to the store and I turned around, I went home, and I gave them all away because the risk of failure with that kind of expression was terrifying to me in a way that acting never was. Really? Um, yeah. And I, You felt more confident in your acting ability. I was willing to be criticized and critiqued as an actress. I mean, which is it's always painful to be criticized, but there was something about it that I could manage in a way I couldn't at that moment in time manage with something that I had made. So it was always a part of my life, but something I did obsessively on my own and then either threw it away or put it in an envelope. But it wasn't until I was really with my husband, who's a wonderful artist, where he showed an appreciation for my drawings that it was like that was outside of me, you know, uh -huh. and, and he put them in a frame mm -hmm. and hang it up next to an incredible mm -hmm. artist or next to his work. And, and you valued his voice as a... Uh, yes, and I don't want to say that 
my my man gave me permission, but there is something about having a supportive partner that helps a person develop. Forget that it's a man. This right. is just your partner in life yeah, who was very right. like I, skilled in that field and very supportive of your talent. Very, very supportive. And then his friends, too. And so I started feeling like I had a little more permission to do this as an outward expression. And things got went on the wall. And then it really was during the COVID lockdown that we had all that time. That's all we had was time. And I had already watched all the apocalypse movies and the zombie movies in like a week and the disaster movies. And I'd done like three or four 3,000 piece jigsaw puzzles. Uh And I was like, this is not a good use of my time. This has got to be something better. So I decided to color because I used to love coloring. And I got these beautiful magic markers that you can blend a little bit. And then I hated all the coloring books, so I decided to make my own coloring book. And that's where it really started, where I was like, I started making these very intricate things for myself to color in. Uh And they started getting bigger and bigger. And I kept running out of ink. And then I started just pouring the ink into a palette and painting with it. And at that point, my husband's like, why are you not just painting with paint? (laughs) So then I learned how to do watercolor and... And they just got larger and larger. Then suddenly I had a studio filled with work. Uh But the subject matter, how did you choose that? I chose what was available to me at the moment, Mm -hmm. which was family photos. I had just moved my parents to Los Angeles because of the pandemic and they're getting older and I was worried about them. And uh, they downsized. So I inherited all their photographs. Uh I mean, I have my parents are hilarious because they take like so many people, they take the same photo (laughs) in front of all the places that they go to. It's so uninteresting. It's literally just them standing in front of, it might as well be backdrops. Uh But they did have a lot of really, really beautiful historical photos going back to, you know, I mean, going way back to the beginning of the 1900s. And then they had film footage. My father had a 16 millimeter camera, so that went back to the 50s. So I had all this incredible material. And as I was looking at it, I realized that Photography has changed so much with digital Mm -hmm. that we've lost a way of collecting memories that it just doesn't exist anymore for young people, especially this sort of these accidental pictures, the ones with a thumb Uh, in the frame, the, the ones you put in the box, not in the book. And they're all like these beautiful, nuanced, caught moments that tell so much more of a story Uh than... than, They're a little blurry sometimes. Blurry. They're, yeah, yeah, they're badly lit. (laughs) They're the picture before everybody turned to smile. Right. That's the shot. It's the shot. That's what's so interesting. And so you get all these beautiful stories when you look at it. And also, I think especially our generation, we collect memories with that texture because mm-hmm. those that's how we remember things based on the photographs we took. So like when when you get a photograph of yourself from a friend that you've never seen, it's it's so overwhelming because you hadn't collected that memory because you didn't have a picture of it. And I'm always looking for images that are kind of, because they're caught moments, because they're in between moments, they're universal in feel mm-hmm. and they can feel like anybody's family. It's really like you just relate to it on a human level. Uh And because I'm an actress for so long and a writer, it's all very narrative, the the images that I'm looking for. And so when you think of yourself as an artist now, I know you kind of feel like you have this asterisk or something by that title. Where does that come from? I feel like artist is a word that somebody else can call you. Uh Do you know what I mean? Right. It's descriptive in a way that needs to be earned to some extent, but who tells you when you've earned it? I suppose, you know, I've been making things my whole life, so I'm a maker of things. Uh But somebody views my work as art, then I'm an artist. So you recently had an art show? Yeah. Right? So artists have art shows. Yeah. (laughs) So that's one way to know. Yeah. And your show was really popular. Yeah, it was great. It was really well received. It's been very exciting. And it's really nice because people from all walks of my life, because I've I've lived many lives, have sort of come out of the woodwork to celebrate it, which is just really exciting. I think there's something, and maybe that's why I was so uncomfortable being 
critiqued on this level, but there's something so much more personal in a weird way about oh, okay. making an sense. object than being on film or television. Well, there's a script that somebody wrote. Right, Maybe right. I mean, you're still using you your emotional body, but you're in somebody else's story, whereas this is like All direct you. from you. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to pause here and want to take a quick break. We're back with Lisa Edelstein, actor and artist. So we often talk about power on this show, both in terms of women in powerful roles and how we embrace our own personal power. And I'm curious if, as an actor, you felt taken as seriously as you wanted, perhaps. And did you ever feel like you weren't in power? And then as you got to be more successful, you became more powerful? Being an actress is really challenging on that level. When I went to Los Angeles in the early 90s, introducing myself as an actress was basically like saying, hi, I'm Lisa. I'm a loser. <laughs> it's so nice to meet you. You literally have no power until you have power. There's no in-between. And where that power comes from is experience. Literally having a resume will give you some power where you are you can actually prove that you don't just say that's what you are, but you're actually doing what you are. Actoring is something you have to prove. When you meet somebody and you say you're an actor, if they don't know who you are, right. you need to tell them your resume. Uh huh. Right. There's no other job in the world if you said you were a doctor, they wouldn't ask you to name your patients. <laughs> right. Um, it's just a really weird job that requires evidence for people to believe that that's actually what you do. Uh -huh. um, and that feels very disempowering, especially when you've just started, because at some point you haven't got a resume right. and you just have a belief and you have a talent and you have an enthusiasm for and you have to get to the other side of actually being able to prove this is what you are and what you do. So there's um, a chicken and egg problem, right? There really is. Yeah. And that's why, you know, my rise to success via this very strange route, it's not so strange. It's just unique to me. I think everyone has a unique story to tell because there's no path. There's no uh -huh. route. And well, you're, you're always confident in yourself. I always wanted to do this. So I didn't have a choice. And I don't think if you have a choice, you should do this because it's not important enough to you because it's a very, very difficult life. And it's difficult from the beginning to the end because you are never done proving yourself. There's a thing on IMDb. IMDb is where all of our resumes are listed, the Internet Movie Database. IMDb Pro is for people in the business because you can see, oh, have I worked with that person before? Like, it's it's a little more nuanced. But there's a thing called the star meter on IMDb, which is just so grotesque, which is how much attention that person is getting in that moment. So if you're in the press, even for something terrible, your yeah. star meter will go up, meaning your number will come down. You'll be number 10 or number 500 uh, uh -huh. out of, you know, 80,000. Right. So you're um, looking to become number one is where the top of the... Not me. Not you. One, but, one is. But when who, people yeah, are mm -hmm. casting, it's unbelievable that they actually still use the star meter, which has nothing to do with the person's body of work. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> it only is an attention meter. So if you were out at a dinner or something really visible. Right. And somebody took your picture and it was like something about it was controversial and it ended up splashing all over the mm -hmm. place on the internet, your star meter would go up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if you're getting out of a car at an event and, and you someone trip. sees your underwear. Okay. Someone yeah. sees your underwear. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Your yeah. star meter will go up. Okay. It's absurd. Uh -huh. It drives me crazy. But it's an example of the kind of you lose power when you're not being paid attention to, even if it's negative attention. So the relationship to power in my in that side of my business is very strange. It's an attention business, which I think is ruining the business because now people would rather put an influencer uh -huh. in a role rather than an actor in a role because that influencer has two million followers. Right? Can they act? Doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. It's, right. it's going to raise the eyeballs on that particular production. It's a crazy world. So I want to get a project that is out right now that is on PBS. Yes. It's called Little Bird. Yes. And we mentioned it in the intro, but tell us about this project. Well, Little Bird, I mean, you're talking about power. 
it's interesting because I'm not the star of Little Bird. Little Bird is really the stars of Little Bird are indigenous actors from Canada. But because of my position in the world as being a working actor for a long period of time, I'm there to really help raise the eyeballs Mm -hmm. on this story that no one would see if all they were looking for was a famous actor to watch on TV. So in a way, that is part of my job on Little Bird is to help bring eyeballs to Mm -hmm. Little Bird. It's a really beautiful show about this thing called the 60s scoop that happened in Canada where the Canadian government, in an attempt to fix the damage done by the residential school systems, which were run by the church for 100 years or more, where the children of Indigenous families were stolen off reservations and put into these residential school systems where they had no parenting, they were raised as a group, their names were removed, their cultures, their language, they were Christianized. They have now discovered mass graves by where these schools were. They were not loved or cared for. And then they were thrown back onto the reservation. So this very slow and cruel decimation of these cultures happened here too. But it, So let's just say in North America, that led to a lot of desperation, a lot of alcoholism, a lot of drug addiction. So the so in the 1960s, the, uh, the way to fix it, they thought, was instead of taking these kids and putting them in these residential schools, let's just take all the children and siphon them out to white families. And it was a horrific system, extremely obviously racist. And in a way, society at large was complicit because they were told these children were abandoned. And they had no reason to not believe that based on their understanding of what indigenous culture was, Mm -hmm. right? There was no questioning that framework because of racism. But at the same time, most people who adopted these children thought they were doing a good deed, that they were adopting a a child that had been abandoned by their family. But these kids were stolen. There were 50,000 kids who were taken from their families who wanted them. And the adopted parents were encouraged to change their names, to not talk about where they were from originally. Just erase any... Erase the past, even though some of these kids were five, six, seven years old, to help cure them of the thing that was going to destroy their lives if they didn't become more like white people. So I play a woman who adopted one of these kids. And my character happens to also have been a Holocaust survivor. So for her, she lost her whole family in Auschwitz. And I think for her, she adopted this child who, in her mind, also lost her whole family because they would connect to each other in this way. And and she indeed was very close to her daughter, very loving relationship. But now her daughter's 25. It's the 1980s. Her daughter's engaged to get married. And her daughter cannot go a step further without discovering where she's from. And so it's this sort of two-time period storytelling where you see what happened to the daughter as a child, but now you see her as a grown woman trying to find her way back to this family she doesn't know. And it's devastatingly beautiful, shot beautifully. It was extremely meaningful for me because the first episode we're in Montreal where that's where I raised her. But when I come back into the story later in episode four, now we're Everything was shot on reservations, and I never really spent any time on reservations, and it was very eye-opening. I felt really honored to be included because it was 90% Indigenous cast and crew, a lot of women, and a lot of storytelling, a lot of cultural sharing. My being Jewish, my characters being a Holocaust survivor was very much part of the story. The show was executive produced by a woman who... Half her family are are residential school survivors, and the other half of her family are Holocaust survivors. So she Mm -hmm. comes to it very honestly. Mm -hmm. She was actually taken from her mom in the 60s scoop, but because they knew a social worker who was retiring and didn't care about keeping their job anymore, she Mm -hmm. was able to be given back to her mother when she was three months old. I didn't even know that when we were shooting it. I actually read that in an article that she did. But um, really powerful stuff. And... It's very, very beautiful and I think really important show. So you're proud of that work? I'm really proud of it. Right. I'm, and uh-huh. and while I was sitting in my trailer, I was making paintings. Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> in fact, one of the ones you got, I actually made in my trailer. Wh- which one? Bird. I think flowers. B- flower. I yeah. love flowers. Flowers. I made that while I was shooting Little Bird. All right. We're going to have to take another quick break and we will come back with Lightning Round. 
And we're back with our lightning round. So, okay, here we go. You may know this best as would you rather. And the only challenge is you can't think about the answer. You just have to just tell us the oh, first gosh. one that pops into your head. Okay. Acting or painting? I can't make that choice. Okay. <laughs> They're tied uh, together. Tied together. All yeah. right. Sky blue or cerulean blue? Mm, sky blue. Okay. Period piece or futuristic space drama? Futuristic space drama. Really? Yeah, I'm a super sci-fi nerd. Interesting. Yeah. Well, all the apocalypse movies. Yeah, I okay. love it. I love science fiction. Okay. I would have thought you would have said period piece. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm surprising. You are surprising. <laughs> <laughs> L.A. or New York City? New York. Really? I mean, I love my life in L.A., but uh -huh. I, as a city, New York is a more exciting place to sort of engage with because L.A., you're just stuck in your car. Right. I'm glad you said that. I love New York. Yeah. Grew up in L.A., but I love New York. Okay. Tofu or tempeh? Tofu. Okay. You're vegan? Yes. Right. Okay. Studio 54 back in the day or Bravo Studios? Studio 54. <laughs> okay. Fiction or nonfiction? I'm right in between right now. Okay. What are you in between? Well, I listen to books mm -hmm. when I paint. Mm -hmm. So I've been listening to a lot of books about the Middle East, weirdly, for the last year and a half. But I also really enjoy being taken on a journey. But because I like science fiction so much, it's hard to find very good books. Like a lot of it is fantasy or a lot of battles. Uh, right. <laughs> like it's not really what I like. Uh -huh. I'm so specific. But I'm always looking for good storytelling. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, so you're a storyteller in a lot of ways. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. If you could have dinner with anyone alive or dead, who would it be and why? Moses. Okay. I'd just like to get to the bottom of the story. <laughs> <laughs> what did he really think? Yeah, what it? really happened? <laughs> it's a lot of a lot of different information. <laughs> uh, okay. And the last one. What is the best investment you've ever made and the worst investment you've ever made? And it's a very broad definition of the word investment. It could be a class. It could be something you read. It could be anything. I think... When you're an artist of any kind, I think in both cases for me, on the entertainment side and on the painting side, investing in yourself, like literally paying for materials, literally giving yourself the time to succeed is an investment that I would never take back. And you were asking before, like, was I scared to do it? And no, it's that is the best investment that I ever made was just to allow myself to be the me I wanted to be which I think a lot of people get talked out of at a very young age. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was 11, we had to write an essay in school about what we wanted to be when we grew up. So I wrote I wanted to be an actress, and we had to read it out loud, and everybody laughed. Really? Yeah, because at 11 years old, they had already been talked out of that idea as a possibility, as a reality, uh -huh. at 11. Um, all right. And the worst investment? I don't have a worst investment, only because I've made a lot of difficult choices. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've I've done some things that terrify me when I look back as a grown-up, like, what were you doing? But I'm happy with my life. And so uh, even those things that you might view as mistakes or missteps or misguided are actually really important in terms of how you get to, to this where you, place. And if you're happy in this place. Yeah. I I was a very messy young adult. Like, I really feel like I didn't actually become an adult till I was in my 40s, mid-40s. Uh -huh. Well, you know, you got married in your 40s. I met my husband uh -huh. in my 40s because I, at that point I had landed on my feet. And it really was so chaotic for so long. Maybe it's menopause, you know, like I really didn't hit menopause till later. But when I finally went through menopause, I thought, oh, that's, this is me again. Like there's something about getting off that crazy sort of hormonal chemical roller coaster that made me feel so grounded and so just like present for my life again and not distracted by chemicals swinging me one direction or another. I think that's the greatest thing about menopause. And it's so interesting to me because it's the time in a woman's life in terms of storytelling that the fewest stories are told. Like uh -huh. you're 
the mom in the background of a young person's story Mm -hmm. until you're an old lady who might be like the wise woman. But this period of time, it's like we are so powerful as women. We are no longer fertile. We're not worried about any of that crap. And now we can just take everything we've ever experienced and everything we've learned and all our successes and failures and really apply them in the world. And we're still young with all this energy and focus. And nobody wants to tell that story. It's fascinating to me. We have to really work at telling these stories now. And I really feel like you could be the person to make that happen. I hope so. (laughs) Um, All right. So, Lisa, this has been a fun and fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Where can our listeners learn more about you and watch your new limited series, Little Bird? Little Bird's on PBS, and uh, my paintings are on lisaedelsteinpaintings.com. And I'm on Instagram at Lisa Edelstein. Sometimes I post what's going on. Yeah. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me today on How She Does It. Thank you so much to Lisa Edelstein for sharing her creative journey with us as an artist and an actor. When you have a moment, please follow us on Apple Podcasts and subscribe to updates from the Her Money community at hermoney.com slash subscribe. Our producers are Catherine Tuggle and Haley Pascalides with help from everyone at Her Money. This podcast is mixed and mastered out of CDM Sound Studios, And our music is from Video Helper, and our show comes to you through Megaphone. Have a great week, and I look forward to seeing you here with us again. Onward.